Hi, my name is Frances Spry, and in this short video lecture, I'm going to present different pair of opposites that can describe different positions in the sustainability discourse. So today we see that there are a lot of people that agree that sustainability is a good thing and that talk about sustainability and sustainable development. However, there are different views on what exactly is sustainable and how we achieve sustainable development. In this lecture, we're going to look at different pair of opposites that could explain uh, these differences. So some of these pair of opposites are related to the problem. What is sustainable? What is not sustainable? Uh, however, in this uh, lecture, I'm going to focus on the solution oriented related uh, pair of opposites. So how do people differ in their way of seeing what, how we can achieve sustainability and sustainable development? Of course, this is not a black and white scale between the two and people tend to lean in one direction and the other. And maybe you listening to this will think, well, the solution is actually somewhere in the middle. And that might be the case. However, I think it's good to look at these opposites to get a view of where where they lie. And then one can pose oneself where one wants to do in the gliding scale between them. So let's look, let us look at the first pair of opposite, and that's efficiency versus sufficiency. On the efficiency side, you have those that say that what we need to do is to make sure that our appliances, our houses, our resource use becomes much more efficient. That is that we have to use fewer kilowatt hours per square meter for heating our houses, or fewer liters gasoline per kilometer when, when driving the cars. On the other hand, you have those that are sufficiency proponents that say that efficiency is not enough, mainly because it leads to more consumption of these services. So instead, we should put a limit to how much we use these services and these products. So for example, for houses, it doesn't matter, they would say, how efficiently we heat our houses if they continue to become bigger and bigger. Instead, we should focus, for example, on looking at tiny houses, uh, as the picture here the shows one. Or when it comes to driving, that we should drive less or not have uh, as many cars. So on the efficiency side, one sees that one has maybe believe of technology to be able to solve this, to become much more efficient over time. And also a view that we cannot tell people what is enough, what is sufficient how much should they be driving, how big of a house should they have. On the sufficiency side, one is worried that efficiency will lead to this overconsumption and that will not be enough and therefore we will not reduce in absolute terms our research and energy use. This can be, these views can be applied not just to individual appliances, but even to the economy as a whole, that if we just have a more efficient economy that uses less energy and less resources, we can continue to have economic growth and, for example, double our wealth while at the same time having our resource use. On the other hand, there are those that say that no, this is not possible and that we actually have to put a limit to economic growth and this is not enough. Our next pair of opposites are similar to the previous one, but a little bit broader. On the un one hand, we have those that believe in technical fixes. So they see that the main solution to our sustainability challenges are related in new technologies. Could be on the energy side, fusion, a new technology that can come without any CO2 emissions or any other environmental side effects. Or when it comes to our diets, it's laboratory grown meat that does not have the methane emissions or other environmental side effects that uh, meat uh, has. These tend to be very optimistic about both the pace of development of technology, but also the effects of technology. They might also believe in technical fixes because they think that it's very hard to change people's behavior and people's lifestyles. On the other hand, those that believe in lifestyle change they think that technology might not develop as quickly as is necessary or that new technologies 
will bring with them other side effects that we are not aware of today. So they are more skeptical to new technology. Instead, they see that the only solution that we have is that actually people change their values and their behavior when it comes to their diets. It could be changing over to a vegan diet or living a life that is less materialistically dependent, much simpler and moving out maybe to the countryside as David Jumstead proposes in his book, Jordad. We now come to the question who has the main responsibility for handling these challenges and these problems. Is it the individual that should reduce their carbon footprint by flying less, buying more environmentally friendly goods, or buying fair trade goods to handle those inequalities? Or are it the politicians that should be leading the way through policies and taxes such as the carbon tax, or even going one step further and banning and prohibit prohibiting those practices that we don't want, like banning petrol and diesel cars from, from cities. So those that look at the political solutions might think that this is too big of a challenge to be able to hand it over to individuals. And so therefore it has to be done on a political level and it can also be misleading and moving away from the actual problem. So it doesn't matter how much we as individuals do and, and for example, reduce our own carbon footprint if we still have uh, big coal power plants that are emitting CO2. On the individual side, maybe one does believe that politicians should be doing more, but has lost faith in them and therefore sees that the only way to move this forward is to create a grassroots movement and put uh, and, and make sure that changes come that way. And then, of course, there are those that say, well, yes, the individual has a lot of responsibility, but their main responsibility is to put pressure on the politicians and make sure that they do the right thing. So the last pair opposite lies in to which extent do we believe that the root of our sustainability challenges lie in the way that we organize our society? Can we continue to have an industrialized market-based economy uh, that relies on capitalism or do we have to make more radical changes in the way we organize our society? So reformism is normally seen as something where you do small gradual changes and one example when it comes to our diets it would be instead of completely giving up meat we would reduce the amount of meat through Meat Free Mondays or through the example here of Svensk Falerich, this traditional Swedish sausage that only would have in this case 47% uh, vegetables and then the rest meat. Or do we need to radically change our diets and go over to a more vegan diet? When it comes to society, it's more of a question, can we adjust the, the problems that we have through minor reforms, through taxes, through making sure the prices are right, through new trade agreements. And, and, and those who believe in that that's what we need to do might also believe that we have that's the way forward because capitalism actually gives us the tool, the possibility to develop technologies and that will be part of fixing the environmental problems that we have caused. On the other hand, you have proponents such as Naomi Klein that believe that no, the root of the problem is actually capitalism. So if we're going to solve the sustainability challenges, we have to change the way our society is organized. You can read more about these pair of opposites in chapter five of our book, Sustainable Development, Nuances and Perspectives. Thank you.